So let me bring to the show our first guest this morning, Brunel Rosa, CEO of Rosa Rubini Associates. Good morning and thank you so much for joining us. Good morning, everybody. So let's just kick off with markets. What do you think markets need to hear in order to calm down? Because we do see once again a major selling yesterday post inflation data. Today we do see futures slightly below the flat line, but, but the outlook is not really clear. Well, uh, a combination of rising interest rates and uh, higher inflation uh, with soft data is probably the worst possible combination for asset markets, uh, especially risky assets, but of course also in fixed income. And we saw the 10-year yield in the U.S. reaching the 2% for the first time after a very long while. The two-year yield in the U.S. also reaching pre-pandemic levels. And oh, let's not forget the... Um, Boom I mean, negative uh, rates seems to be ancient history by now. So clearly, there's lots of repricing, um, and that's kind of obvious if you give a bit of a combination uh, of macro data, as I suggested before. What can central bank do about it? Well, not much more than they've already done in the last few weeks. Uh, almost, almost every G10 central bank. Um, have now turned more office and uh, has started withdrawing from monetary stimulus. In uh, EM central banks, multiple hikes have already been made by a number of central banks in Brazil and Russia and so on. Actually, they're stopping by now because they think they may have overdone in terms of tightening. So, for those who believe that, for example, the Fed should uh, acting from meeting or do something emergency now between now and uh, March 17 when the uh, FOMC meeting is held I think that's uh, a bit premature I think it will be sending the wrong signal of panic rather than calm in, in the middle of the storm um, I just wanted to um, take a look at Bullard's comments. He supports 1% rate hike by July, uh, which is certainly an extremely hawkish look at the situation. So I was wondering, do you support this idea? Do you think that this is even plausible scenario? Because also, of course, um, hiking rates too fast might be dangerous. Yeah, I think rates too fast too soon can be extremely dangerous. Central banks have done those mistakes in the past. And then they had to revert those moves a few months later because the economy stalled and went into contraction. So uh, it is kind of typical for tightening to come at a steady uh, pace, but more measured than the easing coming all in, uh, in, uh, in much uh, in a much faster fashion. I mean, uh, it's typical to cut rates quite quickly and to increase rates. More gradually, I don't think they are going to move away from these, uh, uh, from from this pattern that is is just common sense to allow market uh, market participants to adjust. Clearly, if one were to believe that a 25 basis points increase in March is not enough, okay, they can always do 50 if they deem that this is uh, uh, important. Of course, the other option would be start reducing the size of the balance sheet much sooner than expected and coming up with an announcement about that already in March. I imagine, in March you might have end of tapering, so end of net, uh, end of net asset purchases, beginning of rate hikes, and an announcement about shrinking the balance sheet. I mean, this is already hawkish enough, I mean, um, solution, I think. So, uh, going beyond that seems to me a bit overdoing, even in the face of 7.5% inflation. I was wondering, do you think reducing the expansive fiscal policy in the U.S., which means, of course, the Biden agenda, which is extremely expansive, could be also, how can I say, a good idea? Because certainly he is getting kind of inflation alarm in these past quarters. Yeah, you're exactly right. I mean, yes, it's a bit of a special case because they not only had very aggressive monetary policy easing, but they also have very aggressive fiscal easing, both under the populist Trump, so to speak, the Republican, and of course under the Democratic administration, which is clearly more prone to social spending and so on. So, the two things combined have resulted, of course, in a huge jump in economic activities, which is what, what people wanted, a massive decrease in uh, unemployment with a tick up in, uh, in the participation rate, and we saw non-farm payrolls, almost half a million added uh, last month 
after a couple of months, perhaps a bit more subdued, it means that the economy is, is really growing fast. And it's not the only country. In the UK, we saw today 7.5% growth in 2021, fastest, uh, fastest growing G7 country, fastest pace of growth since World War II. Clearly, the rebound from the pandemic for those countries who managed to uh, coming out of it um, better uh, proves to be extremely um, advantageous from an economic perspective. And so it is time a bit to dial down both the monetary and the fiscal stimulus, but you know, in moderation, because um, the market and the economy got used to this kind of drug or medicine, if you want, and you have to subtract a little by little. You cannot do it all at once. I was wondering, um, let's just have a very quick check, of course, uh, of the UK data, pretty, pretty positive results. Of course, we, we did see the GDP growth rate year over year, 6.5%, uh, quarter on quarter, 1%, GDP year over year at 6% uh, for December. So I was wondering, um, do, do you think that the Bank of England's path is, how can I say, already clear, which means hiking rates aggressively? Well, first of all, we had the first back-to-back -back, uh, rate increase in February, in coincidence with the monetary policy uh, report. That's the first time since uh, 2004, so it's already quite extraordinary. Now, a major pace would be, I think, hiking at every inflation um, uh, report, or how is it now called, monetary policy report meeting. So, February, July, uh, sorry, February, May, August, and uh, November. Somebody believes there might be a slightly uh, faster pace uh, yet. But let's not forget that inflation in, in the UK is just about 5%. Yes, the FPC believes it's going to reach 7% and slightly above between March and April, but then it's also expected to fall down. So I think if you're talking about around 100, 100 basis points of increasing rates over the course of a year, maybe 125, I think is enough tightening at this stage. Plus, central banks can always act on the central bank uh, balance sheet, and reducing it is has also some tightening effect. Well, let me ask you one final question, which is um, in regards to the geopolitical tensions um, between uh, Ukraine and Russia. President Joe Biden has issued a warning that U.S. citizens should leave uh, Ukraine immediately as tensions with Russia over its military activity uh, continue to intensify. American citizens should leave. Leave now, Biden told NBC's News uh, Lester Holt on Thursday night. We are dealing with one of the largest armies in the world. This is a very different situation and things could go crazy quickly. Um, and, and let me just remind everyone that Russia began a 10-day program of military exercises with its neighbor Belarus. Um, exactly yesterday, NATO estimates 30,000 Russian troops were taking part making Moscow's biggest military deployment uh, in Belarus since the Cold War. Uh, so I was once wondering, because we are reading, of course, um, media headlines that markets are pricing in a diplomatic resolution of the conflict. On the other side, we are hearing Biden's statements and, and of course Russian's actions. So do you think that still military conflict could be, uh, how can I say, prevented? Uh, I think it is possible to prevent it. Of course I hope it's prevented. Um, it, and it's often the case, those solutions are never found from day one. They are probably found at the very last minute, just before everything collapses. Sometimes there are miscalculations and mistakes are made and then uh, mistakes are made and, uh, um, and then the worst happens. Um, hopefully it's not going to be the case. Clearly the two sides are uh, showing their muscles and uh, showing that they are ready uh, to do um, what is needed to regain control of the situation. Russia clearly shows that it's ready to invade if it's the case. The US, by asking its own citizens to leave effectively, they're saying, look, the threat is serious, but we can also retaliate, and retaliate means probably military exchange, and so they don't want American citizens to be involved in this uh, conflict, hence the call to leave the country. But again, um, they hope is that there will not be a military exchange and the space for a last minute uh, negotiation, I think, 
is still there. If they want to reach the conclusion of uh, making Ukraine a sort of new Finland that will never join NATO, will always be between the Russia and, and the rest of Europe to some extent. But let's not forget, and with this I, I like to include my reasoning, Russia has other options to destabilize the country, not just uh, physical invasion. It could engineer a coup. Um, there could be further destabilization of the Russian uh, regions from within, to launch a large scale cyber attack on key Ukrainian uh, infrastructures. So, uh, and for those, it would be much harder to the US to react because NATO is a product of the 40s slash 50s of last century. It is not ready to react to those kind of unconventional uh, uh, provocations or attacks. So that's that's the situation that the U.S. needs to be monitoring very closely and find a solution to it quite fast. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Rene Rosa, CEO Rosa Rubini Associates, thank you for joining us. And of course, have a great weekend. Thank you. I'll see you next time.